Everybody's uh, back now? I think so. Obviously, the previous speakers were a bit taller than I am, but uh, that's not unusual. Uh, if I could introduce myself first of all, my name's David Holdcroft. Um, until recently, I worked for BAA Heathrow, and I was the uh, tough client that Fraser Brown uh, mentioned, although that isn't what they called me at the time. Um, had other names for me. Um, so, yeah, I, I was the person over six years that uh, uh, steered the way that BAA dealt with Ultra and uh, produced the system that, that you now see running. Uh, I'm here really uh, today on behalf of uh, ATRA, ATRA EU, um, who uh, are currently developing their uh, uh, sort of way forward, uh, but are particularly interested in trying to provide an impartial. Uh, source of advice on PRT and GRT systems and um, we'll be in the process of developing uh, websites and, uh, and information resources and those sorts of things so there'll be more on that uh, later. Uh, this morning we have three speakers uh, for you although only two are here I believe at the moment so um, I'm hoping that the, the third one will uh, arrive shortly otherwise I'll have to uh, do some juggling or something to entertain you for half an hour. Um, the, the theme is Public Transport for Tomorrow's Lifestyle, uh, and I'll let the speakers explain uh, a little more on that. How I'd like to do it is if we can run through the, the presentations uh, themselves, unless there's a real point of clarification, and then we'll have some questions at the end. So uh, if you can make a note of what you'd like to ask, um, and if there are, and I'll, I'll ask you a few questions. So, uh, if I could introduce the first speaker, which is, is Debbie Cook. Uh, it looks very promising, good positive start. So, Debbie, if you'd like to come up. My friends affectionately call me Doomer Debbie. <laughs> so, let me get set up here. It's great to be back in. Uh, Sweden, I really never thought I'd, I'd be able to come back again. I was here two years ago for the <coughs> conference and I thought, what a great experience, but now to come back when it's actually relatively warm is really <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so you're probably wondering what this is. This is a Category 5 tornado that ripped through the town of Greensburg in 2007, May of 2007 which in and of itself really isn't that unusual because uh, the U.S. and Midwest has a huge number of tornadoes and especially now with uh, climate change. But I think what is actually unusual about this is that right after this happened, it's a town of 1,500, the hurricane was 1.7 miles wide, 22 miles long. Uh, the unusual thing, though, was that the city council, and this is the middle of America, remember, this is the part of the country that uh, those of us on the coast would love to secede from the nation so that we could rule the world um, in our you know, left-leaning way. Uh, but it, this city council passed a resolution that all city buildings, when they were reconstructed, would be built to the highest LEED standard, the LEED Platinum standard, the highest sustainability standard. That is unusual, and there's a film crew, I guess, that's been filming this, um, their transformation. But what, you know, what the question I'm asking is, who planted the seed in Kansas that got this going? And that is as much as anything, I think, what any uh, conference is about. I woke up last night, in the middle of the night, as you do when you have jet lag, and uh, there was this really loud, crashing noise, and I'm going, what is that? And then I realized it was um, somebody uh, picking up glass bottles for recycling. <laughs> and in the middle of the night, you, you know, you start thinking of, uh, of, of weird things. But I started thinking of all the conferences that I've gone to in my career, and I spent eight years in government, and you just go to, you know, one mindless conference after another. It really is mind-numbing at times. Um, but I don't think I'd ever been asked why I had come. And wouldn't it be interesting if we actually asked people, why are you here? What do you think you're going to get out of this? Did you come because you want to have everything you think reconfirmed? Do you just want to leave believing exactly what you believed before you arrived? Or are you coming just you know, to see people, to get a new spark of excitement? Because that's what I got hearing about the Heathrow experience. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm sorry I can't ask each one of you why you're here, but maybe you can reflect 
on why you came and, and think about what it is you want to take back. Because I want you to take something back from what I say. Maybe I won't say anything profound or anything, but maybe I'll give you some kind of uh, uh, a tip, uh, maybe someone else who is incredible that you can learn from and that this whole pod car experience could learn from to move to a different level. And so what I've discovered after, I do mostly a lot of energy talking, uh, talking about energy and fossil fuels in particular. And um, I kind of, in the, in the last year or two, I got a little stuck in where I was going. I'm going, this just isn't working. And I'll be talking about this, that this afternoon if you happen to be in the session that I'm in. Um, and I learned that when you get stuck, you need to go lateral. And you need to get out of this, you know, whatever the vacuum in, in, you're in. And so I have a lot of hobbies. So I started taking, I actually went and took a, a, a permaculture farming class up in Oregon this past summer. Uh, I, I love genealogy, as Americans do, because, you know, we love to trace our roots back to Europe. And, or wherever, and uh, and so and I love to listen to podcasts. If you don't know about the TED Talks, I mean everybody should know about TED Talks because they are they're so inspirational. TED.com, if you're not familiar with them, uh, but I, I do just a lot of reading on all kinds of subjects, and they kind of spark something. And I came across, so I came across someone who I thought was really intriguing. Uh, this guy named Ted, uh, um, Snowden, Dave Snowden. Uh, he's a Welshman. And he intrigued me because he's doing things differently than, uh, you know, I see so many people, you know, we stand up here and we tell you what you ought to do or whatever, but he's really doing things differently. And he's finding out the narratives that people are telling each other. And, uh, for example, uh, he was working with the UK government and went to Pakistan, and within 48 hours he'd sent all these school kids home to, to come back with the stories that their elders might have wanted them to know, some really important information. And within 48 hours, they had a report on the UK government from 3,000 participants, uh, 1,000 um, in a refugee camp, uh, 9,000 from, from some of the inner urban areas in London, and they had pieced together this narrative that they were kind of clueless about. And you know, I'm thinking when I'm, when I'm out at, or, or about, I'm wondering um, if somebody's using like a pod car, what are they thinking when they're using it? How are we finding out what their thinking is? Because we can so easily poison a system uh, either with a uh, bad experience, so I may take a bad experience of Sweden back home and you don't know what kind of network I have. Maybe I have a blog and I'm putting out all this, this really bad information. So as much as anything, our job is to make sure that we enhance the good stuff that we want to enhance and try to diminish the bad stuff. So one of the things, for example, this guy, you can't, you know, you can't shove it down someone's throat. And that was kind of the stuck place I was in, trying to shove, thing, shove, shove this information, something that I had bought into, down someone's throat. Well, we have a saying, well, some of us have a saying in America, you don't get religion at the airport. And so, for example, in the UK, uh, you don't, you know, don't teach di di biodiversity. Get the school kids to go out and collect bugs or count how many different species there are in the garden. It's a completely different experience and they will learn so much more. So that's the kind of stuff this guy, uh, Dave Snowden, works on. This, he's a complexity theorist and works in that area of highly complex issues that we all face right now. Society is, we're in this really weird kind of scary place or at least it seems to me, and we need to understand complexity and how we can better deal with it. So I wanted to introduce you to Dave Snowden. That was kind of, uh, at least if you go away with something, I want you to go away with just a couple of names. And the other one I'm going to be talking about in my next presentation, and I'll give it to you now because many of you will not be there, and his name is Dan Ariely, A-R-I-E-L-Y. He is a behavioral eco uh, economist. I mean, I never knew there was such a thing. But he does amazingly interesting studies of human behavior, and that's another area that we really need to understand because we think we're rational, and he wrote the book, Irrational, uh, Predictably Irrational, really good book. But we think we act irrationally. We think we're making rational decisions. All of us do, but in reality, we're not. They're very much based upon other things around us, our peers, 
or uh, just the fact that somebody offers you three items instead of two, that they're pushing you toward the answer they want you to give them. And so this, this whole area of behavior has really become, uh, I'm very intrigued by that, and I hope that you'll check them out because they have some really interesting information I think will help the, this whole pod car experience. So let me put this on so I won't get off track too much. <laughs> um, so. Um, creativity. Now, that, that's another really interesting thing that uh, Dave Snowden is doing. He's trying to bring more creativity into the process. We try to, uh, you know, we tell people to be more creative. Well, what makes them more creative? Well, one of the things is if you, rather than telling people, this is the best practice and this is what you have to follow, you give them all these experiences that people have. So if you look at this room, if there was some way for everybody in this room to kind of dialogue with each other, or at least put out, this is my experience, this is what I did in this situation. When you give people 20 or 30 narratives or stories of what they've done, and they can kind of pick and choose, they can then apply it to their situation. That's how you increase creativity. You don't do it by telling people that this is the way it has to be done, which government is very good at. Um, so, okay, so this is, uh, this I thought was creative, so I, I threw it up. This is a park mobile. Somebody in San Francisco decided that in an area that where there wasn't enough greenery, there wasn't enough park space, they took this dumpster, they filled it with soil, plant stuff in it. It's got a park bench, you know, basically on the side is a, a place for people to sit. You put it where you park a car, and you just created a little greenery, a little respite for somebody to sit down. And, uh, and anyway, it's this kind of creativity. How do we share that with people? If I hadn't seen the newspaper that particular day, I wouldn't have known about this. And uh, you know, the government spends millions and millions of dollars collecting energy data. What if we, create, what if we collected creativity data? where we all could share this kind of creativity in a way. We could go to a website, okay, I'm interested in streetscapes, or I'm interested in this. I mean, that, I would love to see the government take a, uh, at something like the Energy Information Administration and create some kind of a, a creative um, kind of a area. Um, this is what we call an unintended land bank. And this is what, if you're interested in transportation, you should be looking at how are we gonna recreate this space, maybe with pod cars or whatever. Uh, but, you know, in America, we, we uh, build projects with a minimum parking space requirement. I don't know if you do that here. Now, some, some communities are getting smart and they're saying, no, like the UK does this. We have a maximum parking space requirement. You cannot build more than this number of parking spaces. And I learned uh, after we went to Copenhagen, Krista took us on a little tour, and one of the ways they dealt with the parking situation was they, uh, or to get more people to ride bikes, was they started reducing the parking spaces by, I think it was 3% a year, and wow. nobody would notice. <laughs> because, you know, we all get used to, we adapt to new, uh, to new price points or new numbers or whatever, and so they got used to this, and so now you have uh, many more people who are, are riding bikes. So there are lots of potentials here, and as we convert these potentials over, these are the kinds of things that we need to share. My friend uh, <coughs> in Vermont he got hit with a, a hurricane. Actually, it turned into a tropical storm. Uh, but this is the kind of damage that was sustained all over Vermont. This is a road that links her be between her house and the shopping, where, you know, where she goes to do grocery shopping. But this was kind of symbolic to me of what government is facing today from every front. They're facing attacks. From the um, you know from from the public, their budgets are being slashed. Uh, they're just uh, they have no resources. That, especially in America, we just don't have the ability to raise taxes. There are just too many people who will deauthorize their elected officials if they should raise their taxes in any way, shape, or form. I know it probably sounds so bizarre to people who in Sweden, but that's that's, that's our world, and that's what we have to deal with. And so government is under attack. And I, I think it's really important that we stop at piling on that, onto that, you know, that big pile. We need to stop piling on the, the, the bang on, on government. Because my, my son who works for the Forest Service says, who do people think government is? A bunch of buildings walking around? No, we are government. Every one of us is government. And we need to start changing that narrative into something that is, a little, uh, that, that is more useful for society. And so, um, so you will see all across America, responses will take on 
the, the character of their community, the, the diversity of the community, and you will see very diverse responses, as I'm sure you see in Europe and throughout the world, that they are, um, they, you know, they're, they're very different everywhere. Um, but I thought I just qu real quickly would reflect on history, because I think history is another kind of area you can go laterally that can be very helpful and informative. My father grew up on the Erie Canal in New York, um, the Erie Canal, 363 miles long from Albany to Buffalo. And uh, I think it's pretty astounding. The, the, the guy who came up with this idea, he went to President Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, our third president, and, he, and tried to get the federal government to put money in. And Jefferson pretty much thought he was a nutcase, um, said you're 100 years ahead of your time. Now that wasn't good enough for him, so he went to the state government and he actually, um, uh, he, he, they were able to get the, the state government as a partner. And they constructed this, really, I mean, in just um, between 1817 and, and it opened in 1825. Pretty amazing. I don't know how long the Heathrow Project took. It probably took about the same amount of time. 363 miles to dig a ditch. And this had, this had the nickname of, of Clinton's Big Ditch for many, many years. But um, it, this was uh, basically, as soon as it was built, it was undersized and they had to immediately start building it wider and deeper. And uh, it was amazing until, until the trains came along. And it cut, it cut transportation costs by 95%. Uh, that's, that's something really uh, important to think about as we move forward in our transportation solutions. Uh, this is Los Angeles back in the early 1900s because someone else had an idea, a guy named Henry Huntington, who my, my town is named after, and uh, he was a land developer, needed, to get, uh, needed for people to be able to get to the land he wanted to sell. And so he started developing this red car line. And it was, amazingly enough, the largest system at the time in the world. That Southern California, I mean, most people think of Southern California as, is deplete of any kind of transportation systems. Now, uh, also interesting was that almost as soon as it was, they started to build it out, he was using 80% of the electricity needs of the region, of the production in the region. So he realized, I gotta have more electricity. So he went up to the Sierra Nevada and built the largest hydro dam in the world at the time, just to power this, this red car line. Uh, and at the time, at, by 1944, when the ridership reached its peak right, right at the end of the war, the population of, of Los Angeles was only 3.3 million. Well, that's the population of Orange County today, which is where I live, and we don't have any kind of rail system. I mean, we have a train that goes through us, but uh, it's not convenient at all for anyone to ride. Uh, so it's, it's good to remember what it, you know, what it looked like, that it operated, that it was built, and in a time when mostly it was human labor and animal labor that built it, uh, we think we have it tough. No, these guys had it tough. So yeah, I think it's a good history lesson. And then, of course, the car came along and somebody thought that this was a good idea, and they all piled on and they built these uh, you know, roads after roads after roads. But we also know, and I think we've always known, that cars were not the solution, that you couldn't widen your way out of this mess. You can widen your way until you turn blue, but it does not alleviate traffic. You widen the highway, it increases traffic. I mean, it's counterintuitive, but it, the reality is it increases traffic because people actually drive more. It's like building a bridge across a river. People will drive more if you build a bridge across a river. Um, so you have you know, four selections from the, from the 20s, the 40s, the 60s. Uh, today, Los Angeles is just one giant mess. And uh, so last year, the um, friend of mine is the general manager of MTA in Los Angeles, which is the trans transit agency there. And he invited me to come and speak to all of the regional transportation agency ge general managers to talk about peaking of world oil production. And I was really excited because this is such an important message for people who are making these decisions for us that are going to, that, uh, you know, we can't build this fast enough. But, um, and he, he admitted to me, because Los Angeles has a very aggressive plan to build out 30 lines in 10 years. 30 lines. One of those will hopefully be to connect the green line to the Los Angeles airport. Uh, they built a, a green line that didn't connect because of the parking revenue. Obviously very short-sighted, but it's true. It was because of the parking revenue. They didn't want to lose that. And so often there are these weird things that kind of drive, our, um, drive the reasons that we build things the way we build them. 
And so this general manager at MTA, um, he he already knew the whole story about peak oil because we've talked many many times. But he wanted his co he wanted his peers to hear the story as well. And he's told me privately. He said, if it were not for my understanding of where we're going with oil production, I would have thought this is too aggressive of a plan. So there is a role to play in people understanding uh, what's happening to our world, to our economy, and how it's all interrelated. Um, but it's it's really key to get it to the right people, to those uh, those public agencies that are making these transportation decisions and others who can change the narrative. Uh, because basically we're stuck in looking in the rearview mirror. We haven't accepted the fact that life has changed, that we really have reset, this is a reset, and how do we move forward from here? Well, one of the things that I think is uh, interesting, this is, um, you know, two pictures of sprawl in, in the, in the west uh, of the United States. And we have just, uh, you know, it's, it's so nice to come into Europe because you see these really highly dense communities. And it really troubles me when I, when I fly in though and I see sprawl happening, and, uh, which I think is happening here in Sweden. You know, people are beginning to sprawl. Uh, but at least in, Cal in Southern California, the transfer, the um, land use planning agency that I used to serve on, has, they understand that this cannot go on and that we have to change the way we commute. And so they have pulled together all of the planning documents from all the cities in the region, and this is a region of, of you know, 18 million people and, and many, 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 you know, hundreds of cities and, and counties, and pulled all that data together to figure out, okay, what are you guys planning to build over the next 10 years, 20 years? Well, they're building single family homes on large lots, or what we consider large lots which is absolutely absurd. That's not what demographics tell us people are going to want because by 2035, it's like half the population, you know, half the demand for new housing is going to be from seniors. Well, seniors don't want single family homes on large lots. They want something else. So the reality is that between now and 2035, Southern California doesn't need to build another single family home. Not another one. They need to build mixed use. They need to build stuff, uh, you know, using land that we already have in the inner cities, making it more dense, walkable, uh, bikeable, all of those things. That's what needs to happen. And, uh, and and pulling all that data together is really helpful because now they're presenting that to all the elected officials in their region, and they're kind of going, well, some of them, not all of them, but some of them are going, yeah, yeah, we got to think this differently. Um, so, I, you know, I thought it was interesting that that you know, housing sales are, they just continue to be in the tank. Although the building industry continues to think we're all going to come out of this, you know, tomorrow's going to be rosy, we're going to start building again. I have a different opinion, but I try not to share it with them. Uh, okay, so as Podcar people are starting to develop plans, uh, Heathrow, whatever comes next, you got to make sure you don't do this. Because this created a headwind for all the, the housing industry uh, or the, the city planners. It created a headwind for decade after decade after decade. Because when people think of high density, this is what they think of. They think of urban, these urban projects. And this thing only lasted 20 years. So we can't be planning systems that only last 20 years and then we have to blow them up. We've got to be planning things that are really, that, that people embrace, that people want to defend. Jim Kunstler has a great comment that we build cities that no one wants to defend. I mean, not Europe, but the United States. Who'd want to defend that, that urban sprawl? But, but we would all want to defend these wonderful older buildings. Uh, Christer drove me through an area he said was a thousand years old. We need to build thousand year old cities. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, none of that junk that creates this headwind. And our decisions have to be better informed. I'm, I, I apologize if I'm speaking to a, um, a lot of optimists and who think that tra air transportation is the, you know, going to continue to grow, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the, the reality is transportation by the air is very dependent upon the cost of fossil fuels. And biofuels are not going to fill that gap because biofuels are going to cost many, many, many times more if they can even make it happen, which is which I'll talk about this afternoon. But um, if they can even make that happen, but these are the op basically the takeoffs and landings in the Southern California region, and we have maybe eight or nine airports. It's one of the busiest air spaces in the world, and uh, and it's very much tied to the price of uh, of fuel. You know, even coming up here on Scandinavian Air, the first airline I've ever been on where they actually charge you for a drink. Uh, they're, they're desperate. They're not doing well. They're, you know, they're, it's not sustainable. Uh, the wealthy people will be able to fly for a long time, but, but the average Joe, like myself, will not. Okay, this is the kind of stupid decision that was made in two airports in Southern California basically in the same year. Uh, 
Long Beach Airport and Orange County Airport both built massive parking structures. They had plenty, ample off-site parking, which could have used, they could have utilized a pod car system. So instead they spent these, they wanted their parking right there, people had to be right there at the airport to pay the premium for parking spaces, basically $50 million for each parking structure. Orange County went even further, they decided to expand their inside terminal because they needed, it needed to be even better. Uh, they now basically have a terminal building that's almost as long as the runway because we have a very short runway. And uh, so this is the kind of, I think, silly responses that we get from a lot of planners who aren't really thinking the, and into the future and, and putting all this stuff together. Okay, just a couple more slides. This one I love because, and maybe some of you saw this, this was a study done. Um, uh, this is basically two countries and um, they show you the wealth distribution in the country. The one on, on your right, 20% 20, 20 of the public owns 84% of the wealth of that nation. The bottom 40% own less than three-tenths of 1% of the wealth of that nation. And then the country, of course, on the left, which is much more evenly dispersed. And so they showed Americans which, you know, which country is the United States. Of course, they all picked this one. That was the one they wanted to live in. Uh, 90, I think it was 94% wanted to live in this country, um, which they thought. They thought this one was China or India. And of course, that's the United States and that's Sweden. So, uh, it, but, but this is a socialist country. You know? <laughs> and you know what Americans think of socialists. <laughs> I say we need more socialists. Uh, and I can say that now because I'm not in politics. Uh, <laughs> and I don't care what I say. So, um, it, it's, it's frightening because you, you cannot look, overlook this disparity. This is what leads to uh, collapse of societies. In fact, Dave Snowden is working with uh, the U.S. military on that very issue of what are the conditions, what are the preconditions for collapse, and that's one of the preconditions for collapse. Okay, so um, so this is Los Angeles, and um, you know we spend a lot of uh, of, of money um, just you know moving people around. And it's, you know, I have to wonder sometimes, what am I doing there? But in many respects, I think you have to bloom where you're planted. You know, we, can't, we all can't move to Sweden. Uh, so, and thank goodness, right? Oh, what a disaster. But, uh, so we have to bloom where we're planted. We have to make the place where we live the best place that we can possibly live in. And so I challenge every one of you, basically, what are you going to do differently tomorrow than you did yesterday? because we all have a role in this and we, all, we can all change the narratives, we can all do better. And with that, I will end, so thank you very much.